life now is cool because I fought for my life. But I think that's a really selfish way of doing it. So I've decided that people look at me as somebody who spoke positively about living with HIV, spoke positively, positively about their sexuality. And what to me is more important is now what I do after. Mm. It's how I continue to live a life that's really positive for people with HIV or people with their sexuality to be able to look at and say, he wasn't just a headline. Right, well, I'm delighted to be joined by, it says there, Gareth Thomas. But actually, I know this gentleman, and there's only one person in the world who's in his life who actually calls you Gareth. Here and right. that is? My mother. <laughs> your mum. And that's because she gave you the name. So why does everybody else in the world who knows you and who's played rugby with you and is a friend of yours, why does everybody call you Alfie? Um, I'd love to say it's about like the Michael Caine suave, sophisticated character, but it literally has nothing to do with him. It's, um, it's from a generation of people who might not know this, but it's from a character, um, an American sitcom character called Alf, which was um, short for alien life form. Right. Yeah, and I remember, what, I remember how I got it. I remember walking into changing rooms as a, as, a, as a kid and somebody had said, the night before, what, they'd watched Alf and he'd got like long ginger hair, like big nose and big ears. No idea why they called me <laughs> Alf. But I had long ginger hair at the time. And I said the worst thing ever. Is when they said to me, oh, you look like that sitcom character last night, Alf. And I remember thinking to myself, you know when you only grab words back in as they're going out? I said, oh, don't call me that. I don't like it. <laughs> and that's like the worst thing you can say. And ever since then, like even my, my grandparents... My grandparents would call me off. The only person on this planet who doesn't call me off is my mother. And yeah. she says, I christened you Gareth, not Alf. Because I remember when I first met you working on the Lions Tour in 2005, where you lot let me down so badly <laughs> by playing so badly against New Zealanders. But I found it quite, because I didn't know you, right? But so people said, you, you arrived late because Toulouse were yeah, playing yeah, yeah. In the, still playing in the championship in the European Cup. And everybody said... It's, he's Alfie, and I can. Why are they calling him Alfie? And I remember calling you Gareth, and you looked at me like I was a weirdo. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, it's interesting because even now I've obviously retired from rugby and do stuff outside of rugby. People are really unsure. They say, "Do I call you Gareth or do I call you Alf?" Because they've heard this Alf from so many people, and I love a nickname. To me, in Wales, I don't know if it's the same in other parts of the world. You kind of, you fall into a nickname and it becomes something that you kind of care and look after. And I always say to people is when you get to know me, you'll eventually start to call me Alf. Yeah. Because you'll start to realize that Gareth, you know, is kind of very official and I'm not an official person. You know, I'm very much um, kind of on a level. I like to have a laugh. I don't like to take things too serious all of the time. And I think Alf is just something that kind of suits my personality. I've grown into the nickname Alf. So uh, and your mum doesn't mind it when other people call you Alf? She's if she was in here now, she'd shout out to you. I'd christened okay. him Gareth. <laughs> She's sick. But nobody listens. <laughs> nobody listens. Because I, I think your nickname really makes it, right? When um, you have articles in the newspaper and they write Gareth Alfie Thomas. Yeah. Or Gareth Thomas, a.k.a. Alfie. Yeah. That's kind of, you know, when your nickname it's has kind of... It's made yeah. it. It's made now, it. You, you, you became... Um, really well known as a rugby player but even in wales rugby is not kind of it's even in wales now it's not like football is it it's not no. like, you're not mega no and yet you were very very well known within a pretty sizable section of the population and yet I, last night i reread your book i read it when it came out because uh, you very kindly sent me a copy even though you spelt my name wrong <laughs> what the go on about it i'm sorry it's you know attention to detail Alf. uh but so you're a, like a big name in Welsh rugby, big name in international rugby, and you've got a wife, and you're coming up to London the whole time because you've got this urge to go and get off with blokes. Yeah. I mean, even now, I kind of, I sort of, even saying that, I think, you know, what, what, what was that like? Yeah, it's really difficult, and that's the thing is because when you say really, you know, good at rugby, I think when you became come good at something in sport, then society puts you into this stereotypical box. And to please everybody else, which is something that sports people 
do. A lot of people do it, but sports people in particular, like they spend their whole life trying to please people or trying to make people like them or like what they do. Um, and that transcends into your personal life, whether you, whether you intend it to or not. So for me, you know, I grew up in a small little town. I became really successful in that town. I was really proud of being able to represent the town, being able to represent my family. Like my dad had this ritual every, every Sunday after a game, he would go over the pub with whatever team I played for the day before with a replica jersey of that with Thomas on the back. So I didn't, re I, I never, when I played for Wales, I realized that playing for Wales or playing for the club, the city, the region, whatever I played for, it wasn't about me. It was about something far bigger than me. And when you, when you step into that, you, you kind of take on this responsibility. And what I didn't want to do was I didn't want to let anyone else down. I was okay about letting myself down, but I didn't want to let anybody else down. So I didn't want my father, as I thought, might be ashamed of me. I didn't want my country to be ashamed of me. So but I it was a risk, but every time you did it, it was a big risk. A, ma a, mass a massive, massive risk. And, and I, I kind of, I feel blessed that when I did it, we weren't in the times we are now of social media, of, you know, instant news. Um, so I came at a time where I knew I was putting myself at risk and I knew I was putting kind of my career at risk. And your family. And my family and everything, like everything that I spoke about that I cared about at risk. But also there was a part of me that kind of had to. Like, and did you never, when you were things. coming up and walking into those pubs in Soho, did you never have a situation where somebody comes and says, you're Alfie? Well, I think being gay is really interesting because um, when you first visit gay pubs or when you first kind of, you know, experience a life of a, of a gay man, as I know, then it's a really lonely place. Like being gay can be really, really lonely because a lot of people, whether they're rugby players or not, come from the same circumstances as me, as they have a certain sense of shame about it. So they don't have gay friends. So when they go to a pub, they can't go to a pub with their friends who are gay because they don't have any other friends. So at that time, especially, a guy would walk into a pub and people might have recognized me, but there's this kind of, you know, I have a really aff affinity with the LGBT community because we kind of know how other people feel and we know how other people want to be kept maybe um, part of their life is, as, a, as a secret. So you can usually tell from people when they walk in a pub if they're okay about where they are or if they're nervous about where they are or if they're ashamed about where they are. Um, so, so for me, I kind of, I, 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 I understood that there was a risk, but also I felt protected by a community of people who would understand exactly what I was going through. And how did you feel when you were on the train or in the car going back to Wales thinking you're going back to Gemma and you're going to pretend that this is all kind of fine. Yeah, horrible. Like, it's, it's you know, I, I feel really selfish that I, that I was doing that, but it was, it was something that I felt I had to do to make my life with Gemma sustainable, to make it the marriage that I wanted it to be. Um, but when you go home, like what you've got to remember is lying is one thing, but when you lie, you live in fear constantly because you live in fear of people knowing you're lying mm. so you say one thing and you wonder if the next time you get asked that question if you you have to remember to say exactly the same thing um so going going home to Gemma for me was a, it, there was a sense of a sense of kind of relief that I was going home to the to the life I loved and the life I created. And, and, you, and you get the sense, I always got the sense you, you really loved Gemma. Oh, wait, do you know what? Never will I ever, ever doubt that. I know, f and, and, and I don't know really if people can fully comprehend it because, you know, I'm an openly gay man, but I believe that, you know, so many people say, you know, love somebody for who they are, you know, not what they look like. Or, and yeah, there has to be a sense of attraction. But we went through, we had a marriage for like, you know, best part of 10 years, right? And we went through some really difficult times, mm. as well as the really good times. But I think the difficult times are when you bond with someone that makes an unbreakable bond. And when you fall in love with them more. So but when you stood at the the, you know, swapping the rings and getting married. Yeah. Did you know then that you were gay? 
Uh, yeah, I knew I was gay, but I also knew that I didn't want to be gay. And I think that's the difference, is that I knew that there was something very different about me, but I felt that this, something that was different about me was something that I could change. And how, uh, what stopped you from, before you got married, from, from telling Gemma? Uh, the fact that I believed that Gemma was the right person for me. I truly, truly believed that. You know, maybe it was a forced by me to make it that way, but um, I felt that we'd been through, you know, we'd had a really good life together, and I thought that I loved her as you love your wife, or somebody else loves their wife, because I'd never been in love, because I'd never, you know, I'd never seen or spoken to another man to understand really what love is. So my version of love, I thought, was what everybody else mm else had because I hadn't come across or had the opportunity to experience anything else. So what I felt for her, which was very, very strong, I thought was the correct feelings. And I thought my doubts are, you know, there's a sense that, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going away and I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping with men every now and again. But then I thought, you know what, other people stand at the altar who might not be that and have doubts for other reasons in their life. So everybody has doubts. Mm. So I kind of managed to justify my doubts. And how hard was it being in this all happening whilst you were in rugby, which has got this reputation and image of being very tough? And you say in the book quite a lot of homophobia that you're kind of having to almost not just go along with, but actually be part of at times. Yeah, I think rugby was rugby's kind of the worst and the best thing that ever happened to me in my life because it was a real outlet for me as well. Um, because there was a lot of times I was really angry and about what I was doing and the a uh, way of getting that anger out was to use it in a, in a, in a way on the rugby field. Um, and also to be, to be in that environment where I could be judged and could be looked at for somebody who has ability, for the one thing that I want, wanted people to judge me on, you know, is like they look at me and they saw Gareth Thomas. So when you see that picture there, yeah, you know, there's a man who's conflicted. There's a man who's got, got, um, got secrets, a man who's like contemplating suicide. Mm. But that moment there in rugby, never ever in my life have I ever felt like where I, to a point where I can just be me. So when you're playing like that, when you're on the field and you're playing, do, were you able to switch off from all the other stuff? Um, there was times I was, and there was times I wasn't, and it was when there was times I wasn't was when I decided, right, okay, you know, kind of, the, 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 in, enough is enough now. But it was definitely, it was, it was definitely a place where I felt like I belonged. Mm. It was a place where the person next to me, I, I didn't think, was even had the time or the inclination to worry about my sexuality. It's they needed me. When, when you before you came to New Zealand. Uh, the rest of us had all been there a few days and, and I was asking a couple of people, what, a couple of the other players, what you were like and, and one of them said, you know, he's gay, don't you? Um, and I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Uh, and he says, open secret. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. But I, did nobody ever discuss it with you? No, and you know what? I, I knew a lot, of the, a lot of the boys did. I knew a lot of people did. And as I see it, I see it as, as a mark of respect because they knew, a lot of them boys knew that I wasn't ready to confront it. Like I wasn't ready to talk about it. I wasn't ready for other people to know. So they protected me yeah. by it being the secret that speak, people spoke about behind my back. Not in nasty ways, no, just the way so. that, you know what? We know, mm. He's gay and we know he's gay and it's fine. Um, but they didn't say to me because um, I felt they knew it would affect my rugby. They knew it would affect, I think, more importantly to them, like my mental state and, and kind of, you know, who I was and, 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 and how I was trying to get to my final point, my final destination of honesty mm. on my own. And actually the account of how the players, just tell the story about how you came out to them and what some of them, particularly Nugget, Martin Williams. Yeah, so I, you know, I had the opportunity to finally disclose my sexuality and I actually told John or Scott Johnson who was the coach and he said to me, look, 
You're in a team of, team here of people who loves you. And you can't do this on your own, you have to tell them. So he, he took what I couldn't do, he took that secret, he's told them, and he said to me, go back to the bar or to the hotel and wait at the hotel. And I remember sitting there, it was like two hours or so of waiting time, and I was like, I can drink, as you well know, I like a drink. I was <laughs> slamming the beer down me, um, not a smoker, but I was smoking away like a chimney, just like petrified of this reaction, because I built this up to be such a big mm. deal. Over years? Oh, years and years. Mm. Like, it felt like my whole life mm. was now coming to a point of where I was telling somebody this secret that I'd mm. held for so long that was going to make or break me. And two of my best friends, and two guys you know really well, Martin Williams and Stephen Jones, who were really, really influential in the team. Mm. Um, and John I sat down with them and told them, and they walked into the hotel and walked past me. And I remember seeing them walk in and thinking, John hasn't told them. Because there was nothing in their walk or nothing in the way they looked that suggested any form of hatred towards me. And Nugget Martin Williams just tapped me on the back and said, mate, is that all it is? Let's have a pint. And, it, and when he said, let's have a pint, it wasn't like, let's have a pint and talk about it. It's like, let's just have a pint because mm. that's what we would normally do. Mm. Um, and I was kind of gutted, to be honest with you, because it was like, hang on now, I spent this, my whole life waiting for this moment, and you don't even want to discuss it, because it genuinely is nothing to you. Um, and I remember thinking, like, you know, that's all I really, if I could have had a perfect scenario, that's all I really ever wanted, because I don't ever want to be celebrated for being a div diverse in a non-diverse environment and I don't want to be neglected for it. I just want to be treated exactly the same. But that's what happened. It's exactly what happened. Mm. Exa and and I, it, tells, it, tells, it, it, it tells a lot about, um, about rugby to me. It tells a lot about what building up um, teammates. Mm. But it also says through. a lot about the way the world has changed because I bet when you started out, if you'd have decided day one, I'm going to tell my teammates at Bridge End, wherever, Cardiff, I'm gay, it wouldn't necessarily have been the same. You know what, interesting, it wouldn't have necessarily been the same because, you know, when I started playing, I remember the first black man to play for Wales, right, Glenn Webb. I played a game and there were 80 minutes were spent, people threw bananas in and they were allowed to do it. And my perception was, well, if I talk about my difference in any mm. way, I'm a young kid, I can't, I'm not going to be able to get away with it. And you know, faggot, bender, all these words were used in the change rooms constantly to describe negative mm. ways that, yeah, like how we'll target them. He's, you know, he can't catch a ball, he's a faggot. And it's like, all right, okay. But a lot of them players who were guilty of that homophobic abuse, when I came out, all of a sudden they realized that they'd created an environment that was not nice towards me and they apologized. And I think, you know, times were different back then, but I think sometimes it takes the person to say to someone, I'm offended by what you're saying because I'm gay. And then you, you change that environment. And well, that's why when you did come out, it became such a big thing. And why then when you talked about having HIV and all the rest of it, you did become a, a trailblazer. Yeah, yeah. I, I, mate, I t tell you one thing, I never set out to be a trailblazer. No, I know that. You know, I, 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 set, I, I did what I did because... I had to take control of my life as a gay man and I had to take control of my life as somebody who was living with HIV. The fact that what happens after it um, is sometimes kind of out of control, but then you take control of that and you say, right, okay, whatever I'm, I, I decided after coming out as gay and I've decided after talking about HIV that it's, it's, it's really possible for me to sit down, put my feet up and say, shit, I've had a hell of a life. It's been a tough one but I'm married, I've got a stepdaughter, and I'm gonna live my life happy, because my life now is cool, because I fought for my life. But I think that's a really selfish way of doing it. So I've decided that people look at me as somebody who spoke positively about living with HIV, spoke positively, positively about their sexuality, and what to me is more important is now what I do after. Mm. It's how I continue to live a life that's really positive for people with HIV or people with their sexuality to be able to look at and say, he wasn't just a headline. He's somebody who, you know, said, told us this headline news, mm. but has actually continued to do really, really good things. The, way, the, way, the place where it actually gives you an advantage over a lot of other sports people, I've always been fascinated, as you know, about elite sportsmen and women, about how difficult they find it to leave the field. Yeah. And 
you've found another purpose, yeah. whereas a lot of them don't. No. Uh, how hard have you found being this... You were a rugby player, that's how you were defined, and now you're defined as a former rugby player who does other stuff. Yeah. So how, how do you kind of cope um, with that? Uh, I love it. I love it because what I've learned, and I learned this kind of the hard way, is that we're all afraid of being afraid, right? And I learned this in the rugby as well, and now I, I do it like every day. So every day of my life, like I don't know what my purpose is, Al, right? I haven't got a clue. I always thought my purpose was to play rugby, but I've evolved into something or somebody who I feel has got more to give, mm. um, but I don't know what. So I'm afraid every day, but I realize, like before you play New Zealand in New Zealand, right, is that you are petrified. <laughs> but at the end of that 80 minutes, the potential of doing something great and doing something amazing, you look back and think, why was I so afraid? So for me now, when I have every day, I wake up every day, like I wake up tomorrow and it's like, I don't know what I got to do today. I'll wake up Sunday, what have I got to do? Because I haven't got a nine to five job. But I know I'm afraid, but I know when I get to the end of that day, I'll know more about me than if I didn't wake up afraid. Because on the other side of fear is who I am. Mm. On the other side of fear is who I'm meant to be. So that's my purpose, is to go into things that make me uncomfortable, things that make me afraid, because that's how I grow, like, that's how I evolve. That's my next chapter and my next book, is, is, is the evolution of who I am. We can't leave New Zealand without, for me, one of the highlights of that trip was your amazing two-word team talk. <laughs> <laughs> now, just, just recall that mathematical failure. Ah, uh, right, okay, so... Um, well, it was the second test. Brian O'Driscoll had been like dumped out in the first test. You would put me in front of every TV camera in New Zealand to like put it out there that we're going to beat them in the second test. And it was like a massive pressure <laughs> for which you slagged me off in the book. Yes, yes, you deserve it. <laughs> there was this like massive pressure going into the second test because obviously if we lost that, the series is over. It's yeah. Three games, series is over. And I remember getting the boys in the huddle, and it was like my mother's words were ringing in my ear. She just like. Be yourself, like be who you are. Say what you feel is right. Say it from your guts. And I remember saying, and the boys all look at me, and I was like, boys, before the game now, I can sum this all up in two words. And I remember they were all looking at me, and all of a sudden you got the Scottish, the English, solicitors, lawyers, <laughs> thinking, to me, how the hell is this guy going to sum up the pressure we're under now in two words, like two simple words? And I remember looking at him, going, boys, two two simple words, or like a, don't fucking panic. <laughs> And I, was, <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember all going, like, not wanting to say something, but like going, I'm sure that's like three words. <laughs> yeah, and that was my introduction. And that was all because of the pressure you put me oh, under. Oh, yeah, yeah, blame me. I can blame for everything. <laughs> Listen, if we've got a couple of minutes left. You, what, how do you see your life now, Gwen? You, you're doing telly, you do different stuff. Yeah. You got the book. I, do you know what? I see my life going. I, I, I am, um, I'm somebody who lives every minute of their life, making sure that people are aware of diversity, that people are aware of the language they use, that people are, are aware um, of the environment they're in, and that they don't create horrible environments. So whether we're sitting in this beautiful church, whether we're in the back in there, whether I'm at, at home, whether I'm in a pub. I, I, I live my life like that because I don't feel like I have a job because I like rather think I have a purpose. Be and a purpose is something that you live by all the time. So for me, that's, that's how I live my life now. What I couldn't work out from this, and we've never talked about it, but I, I, have you got God? Are you, do you believe in God? I believe in God. I'm not, I wouldn't say, I'm not, I'm not religious to a point that I've, I, I speak about it a lot, but I'm religious because, trust me, but, well, you probably have, mate. No, I'm not, you probably have, but I just found it in different ways. I have been on the edge of a cliff more times than I care to remember, more times than I want to remember, and I've always found that there's something that's brought me back from that cliff, right? Mm. Now, I don't know what it is, but to me, I believe that there's something that has brought me back from the earth. And, I, and the only thing I know of is, a, is God. I don't know of anything else. But you've talked about the, the cliff is like when you want to kill yourself and throw yeah. yourself off it. Is, is, that, is that gone now? Or do you still get suicidal thoughts? Mate, it's gone. And, I, and it's gone because I brought my back 
myself back from the cliff. So I will never take myself to the cliff again. I've, I never. But was it related to not being able to confront your sexuality? Uh, relate to not related to the fact that I didn't think everybody else could accept me for my sexuality. And has anybody not accepted you? Um, no. I had to think because I'm thinking, you know, I, I know the world we live in, so I know that there is a reality, like, you know. Like you I, don't I, even get the old bit of abuse walking around the place. Oh, mate, I, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got jumped two years ago in Cardiff yeah, by, yeah, by a group of kids. Yeah. Um, but they learned. Uh, when you talk about, like, homophobic attacks, I'm not sure if ever, some people just attack or are homophobically abusive because it's just language. They're not actual homophobic. They don't actually realize what it means. They just think it's a way of harming people and hurting people. So I know it is. But again, you know, I realize that the world is bigger than Wales I live in. You know, we live in a country that's 70, 70 countries in this world is still illegal to be gay in. Yeah. So we go to 70 countries in this world and you realize that, you know, if I was a Gareth Thomas living in that country, it'd be illegal for my existence. Mm. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think just because it doesn't happen to me, it doesn't happen to everybody else. And that's why I continue to fight. Well, listen, it's always lovely to talk to you. You too. One of the best things about that tour, even though you let me down on the pitch, and <laughs> poor old Clive got battered for it, and I got battered a lot, was actually getting to know you and staying in touch. And you're a top bloke, and it's been a joy talking to you. Mate, I really like this. It's real good to see you again. Clap. <laughs> on cue stop <laughs> brilliant <laughs> cheers bad man